Welcome to Ignite Interviews. I'm Cindy Donahue. I'm very excited to be joined today by Chef Chad White, who is a Top Chef finalist and is a prolific entrepreneur here in the Spokane region. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to get to talk to you about all your amazing passion projects and restaurants. And Well, it's my pleasure to be here. It's yeah. exciting. Why don't you kind of list them out for us, of all of your restaurants? Yeah, so um, I moved back here in 2016. I was born and raised, left uh, and joined the military. Um, and after developing a, a career in San Diego, I moved back um, and opened up a restaurant called Zona Blanca. Uh, it's a ceviche bar that was first opened up in the Luminaria building, um, which is in an interesting part of town, right? It's a, uh, you know, an, an older historical building. Um, it used to be a punk rock show venue. Um, it used to be a coffee shop, all these different things. You know, when people come in, they tell us all these, these, these rad stories, but it was ultimately street Mexican ceviche in the back of a dive bar on a pretty rough street. Um, and that restaurant, um, did very, very well. We won, um, numerous awards from chef of the year, three years running, uh, best new restaurant, um, runner up for best seafood in the city. And then it helped us launch all the other projects that we have. So in 2019, we opened up, um, high tide lobster bar, just right across the skywalk from you guys. Um, and then we opened a second location later in 2019 in the wonder building. Uh, it's a New England style lobster roll c concept, right? Just very simple, delicious, buttery, soft bread and luscious lobster, right? I love that. Um, luscious lobster. Yeah. Who doesn't want that? Yeah. <laughs> unless you're, you know, you have a shellfish allergy, then I would, <laughs> I would recommend uh, not doing it unless you really enjoy stabbing yourself with an EpiPen. Um, the same year, we also opened up TT's Old Iron Brewery and Barbecue. Um, TT started out as a brewery in the same space that Zona Blanca got its start in their incubator brew system and out behind the Steel Barrel Tap Room. Okay. Um, Travis Tosath is my partner. He started it as this like kind of like pet project. He was uh, a storeroom manager at Frito Lay for 25 years and really loves vehicles um, and beer. And so he kind of named a lot of his beers um, in regards to automotive. Um, he has uh, you know, restored a bunch of Model Ts and things like that, and he's a pretty darn good welder. And so everything was like this old clad iron concept uh, for beer. And while he was at the um, Steel Barrel getting his name out there, he had approached me and said, I'm really looking to go a little bit bigger. Um, I want to outgrow this this place and I want this to be my full-time job and I'm going to quit my job and build my dream. Um, and he asked me if I would consult and I was like, heck yeah, I think you're a really cool guy. You work very hard. Um, his product was great. And a couple months down the road, after looking at a few spots and our lawyers talking to each other, we just decided to go 50, 50. Uh, and so we opened up TTs out in the Valley. Um, everyone in the world was telling me that I was crazy. Um, but for me, it's very nostalgic. I grew up in the Valley. I went to junior high at horizon junior high, which is just a quarter mile away. Um, and I went to the Chester store, which is catty corner from where we're at to get ice cream after junior high. Right. And so, so it's nostalgic for you. Very nostalgic. So cool. Yeah, it was, it was, it was the right thing. And a lot of people don't know this about the Ponderosa area. You can't see any of the houses when you're on dish from Mike and Bowdish, but up in those hills of trees, there are thousands of homes. And I knew that. Um, and Travis grew up in the area. His daughters went to Freeman High School. So he's very familiar with the locale. And we both were like, dude, this is a home run. I can't believe this place is vacant. We have to snag it up. And we built our dream. And what kind of food is the barbecue? But what are your, some of your favorite dishes that you have there? So we really specialize in Texas style brisket. Um, so as far as, you know, we import our wood from Texas, post oak. Um, we bought uh, very specific smokers that we started out with, including building an offset of our own, then realized that we couldn't keep up with demand and end up going to Missouri and finding these old hickory uh, rotating smokers um, that kind of just allows us to operate in a much higher level very consistently. Um, and then, you know, we take inspiration from Carolinas uh, for the pulled pork and from Kansas City for our ribs. And those are the things that we really specialize. But to be honest with you, 
my favorite thing on the menu is our smoked turkey. We do smoked turkey exceptionally well, and I'm not here to brag about what we do. I'm still dumbfounded every day on why turkey, the protein that typically dries out the most on a smoker, is my favorite thing still to this day. That's so funny. And you've really had to be creative to stay true to the vision of what you wanted TTs to be, it sounds like. I mean, you've had to go far and wide to get the right equipment to make the flavors Absolutely. Um, And then staying true to like what real barbecue is. And not to say that there aren't incredible barbecue places here. It's just you go to West Texas and you go to Carolina and you go to Kansas City and they run out of food. People are lined up on the street in lawn chairs for hours waiting for their chance to get good barbecue. And when it's out, it's out. And when we first opened and we were met with all kinds of frustration from the locale because they it's weren't gone, used to that. Yeah. When right? it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. And, and we had to, um, we had to really stand our ground in that and let people know, like, we're not going to reheat our food. What's put on our smoker this morning is what's going to get served that day. And if it's, if it's still available the next day, we're either going to run a really cheap pulled pork sandwich special, or we're giving it to charity. Wow. We're, we're refusing to reheat our brisket, and we're slicing our brisket the proper way, trimming it the proper way. My pit master, Colin Barker, is a complete barbecue nerd. But the crazy thing about all of it, um, looking back, is he's a barbecue enthusiast, but prior to coming to TT's, he was a full-time pastor. Oh, wow. And working with us for the first, like, 90 days, he was a part-time pit master and a full-time pastor. Oh. And ended up leaving his pastoral work to come in what I call, he's a pit pastor. <laughs> That's so great, it's a pit pastor. But it's so great that you have a team that works so well together and that you have pieces of the puzzle, basically, that create something spectacular. Absolutely. I mean, that's the biggest thing that we've realized uh, through our growth pattern is is putting the right people in the right positions. Everyone from, you know, Travis down to our general manager, Nicole Flurchinger, um, to our assistant pit master below Colin of, uh, you know, his name's Scott Randall. He is incredible. He came from, uh, child protective services, wow. but had a passion for barbecue. Um, and the truth of the matter is you don't have to come from 25 years of experience in this area. You just have to be able to, you have to want to love it and you have to want to bleed for it. You have right? to work really hard very, and very be part hard. of a team. Yeah. And this isn't easy work. I mean, it's long hours. You're hunking, you know, a couple hundred pounds of meat per day around from boxes, trimming for the next day. I mean, every day is a hustle. Um, and these guys kill it. And their leadership has passed all the way down to our dishwashers. Um, and everyone is on the same page and they communicate and they work hard and, and they love what they do. And it makes it very easy for me to be successful when I have such an incredible team uh, that believes in the mission that we've put together. And did that contribute to you creating the hospitality group? Cause now you kind of have a, a layer, right? Can you tell me about how that works? The hospitality group? Absolutely. I mean, each individual restaurant on its own from start to where it is now has had its own unique obstacles, right? Or opportunities what I like to call them. Um, but understanding that I couldn't do the work on my own anymore and I needed to hire people that knew things I didn't know, um, was really important. And the hospitality group actually came about because of COVID. It, I wasn't even thinking about building a hospitality group whatsoever. I had talked to, um, a mentor of mine who I brought up, who is now my corporate chef. His name is Hannes Coven. Uh, he's from San Diego. He'd been you know, been a chef there for 30 plus years. Um, he's got about 18 years on me. Um, and he is just incredible. And he's, he's gone through the same kind of successes and failures that I have gone through. Um, but I always led to him as a friend and a mentor. And I had let him know, like, I'm trying to find ways to keep my business afloat. Just like every other restaurant tour in the city, we were faced with a yeah. really extreme uh, situation. And, and not that it's just our industry, but I think a lot of people um, who are business owners understand what I'm talking about. And some people who are not, you know, it, it's hard to imagine everything that goes on, right? I'm a father to 35 employees. People Whether you have to care for. Yeah, but you care for not. them. Yeah. I do. It's your and family. Like I mentioned early, earlier, 
everything I have is because of my team, right? I may have had the vision. I may have been the person to work really hard and put the pieces together, but you can only hold on to so many pieces on your own, right? Um, and so I reached out um, to Hannes and asked him some questions, and then I started doing consulting work for businesses um, that were looking to kind of get through the struggles that they were going through, and that allowed me to turn a little bit of an income to support the restaurants that were closed and still having to pay their bills. Right. Um, and so we formed Chad White Hospitality Group, um, and I brought Hannes Coven on around June. Um, and since then, what we've been able to do with each one of the concepts is really remarkable. All the areas that I wasn't able to get to, he was able to go in and provide that second layer of support to the team, provide leadership um, and, and corrective action uh, in areas that we were missing, you know, and, and kind of like what I was just talking about with having to, you know, the word everyone hates to use, but I use it anyways, cause I think it's cool pivot. Um, it, we had to make very quick changes to all of our business models. And in doing so, we found out just how terrible we were running our businesses. <laughs> you found the holes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're, we're when you're, busy right and you have lines and the revenue is coming in you're keeping up it's really easy to overlook where yeah. the flood is yeah. <laughs> right yeah um but when you don't have anything coming in those holes are huge and we focused first on those holes um repairing those looking at ourselves uh how we were operating our businesses and how we could be more efficient how we can have better communication how we can minimize. I mean, we have so much fluff. Like, why do we have all this stuff? It doesn't matter. Let's focus on these things that are that are our breadwinners. So it really sounds like you admire and you acknowledge that your success is also due to recognizing where you uh, succeed or what your talents are versus someone else could come and contribute to the team. I mean, it's really being a team leader um, as much as being innovative. Absolutely. And I've had to learn. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I tell some stories a lot when I was – Gosh, I think it was my first executive chef job. I was 25 or 26 years old. Um, maybe I was younger than that. Maybe it was like 23. And I was at the Double Tree Golf Resort in San Diego uh, near um, Rancho Penasquitas. And I had worked for chefs who were pretty aggressive, right? Like, if. Like the TV shows. Yeah. <laughs> there's a likeliness that a plate may come flying by your head at some point. Right. And, I, and I'm not making it up. It's just that was kind of what it was like. And what it was like before I came along was probably even even worse. Right. Um, I've heard all kinds of horror stories, but I'd be the type of person that would walk into the kitchen and a blender would be running unattended without a lid on it. And I'd throw it on high and paint the ceiling because I felt that was my way of teaching my team that don't leave equipment unattended instead of walking over explaining all of the reasons why and then counseling them properly. Right. Um, I've been reading a lot of books lately and trying to just understand how I could be a better leader. And one of the leadership books that I've read is called extreme ownership. And I don't know if you've ever heard of it, um, but it's two Navy seals and they write this book and it's all about, there's no such thing as bad teammates or bad employees, there's only bad leaders. So it really makes you look inward and go, all right, yeah, I have a team member that I can't quite get on the path that I need them on. What am I doing wrong? Why am I not getting them to where they need to be? Not what are they doing wrong? Exactly. What am I doing wrong to lead them? Better? And so that's yeah. been a massive change in our company. Um, and almost all of my managers have now read it because I'm like, Holy crud. Um, and then there's a second book called The Dichotomy of Leadership. And it goes back in and kind of explains like, all right, you can have extreme ownership and it's very important. But at some point you have to realize when the writing's on the wall and when you need to uh, lead somebody out of your business. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of what I've done in my last like 12 months is really just focused inward, um, which has allowed me to then focus on my team and give them the leadership that they need. Um, 
And as if they're leading properly, then I can go off and do more cool things. So awesome. And so where are the restaurants now in terms of being open, not open, takeout? So where, where are they all at, at the moment? So um, High Tide Lobster Bar 1 and 2 are both open. Mm-hmm. High Tide 1 opened up today. Um, we're not quite celebrating yet, but today is officially our two-year uh, birth. Wow, congratulations. Right? So we are super stoked to be back open. Um, we closed exactly a year ago, and today is our first day back. Wow. Um, High Tide 2 has been open um, off and on, um, but it's been steadily open for, I'd say, the last six to seven months. Uh, we do have dine-in uh, seating at 25% occupancy for both of those locations. TT's has been cranking since day one. We are the, we're the perfect food for COVID, right? At the end of the day, we're, we're family food. Um, you can buy it in large format or single sandwiches. We have online ordering. It's just super simple. But now we have 25% occupancy and we have indoor and outdoor seating. Uh, so if people are willing to brave the like 45, 50 degree weather and the sun's out, we have heaters to keep them toasty. And then we have our doors shut and people can dine inside. Um, so we have about 40 seats total uh, between the patio and indoors. And then Zona Blanca, which we are very excited about, is moving from the location on Madison yeah. to Howard. Basically, if you drew a straight line heading east from where we were on Madison uh, to the Holly Mason building, yeah. right along the same railroad track, um, that's our new location in the old Rocket Bakery. Oh, yeah, I know exactly. So that's honestly my favorite. So it was on Zona Blanca, the um, shrimp and the avocado. Ooh. My go-to every time. I, that's my favorite. The agua chili. <laughs> yeah, no. So we are expanding that concept because this is a much larger space. Uh-huh. And so we'll have our own bar now, and we'll be really focusing on the margarita side of things. Um, and then other agave spirits like Sotol, Bacanora, uh, Mezcal, and so on and so forth. But then we're adding oysters so we'll have an oyster bar wow. we're gonna have tacos on the menu daily um obviously ceviche we can't go away with that uh and then we're gonna have entrees and different styles of tostadas and it's gonna be really cool and then there will be a, a center part of the menu that is like a, a meal for two or four it's 150 dollars. you get a whole lobster split in half uh cooked um puerto nuevo style which is you know halfway down um the baja norte peninsula uh, to Ensenada. And then, you know, there'll be ceviche, a dozen oysters, um, uh, Caesar salad from Tijuana and all these just different things that are just really, really exciting. And then margaritas for two, basically. It's so Um, fun listening to you talk because you can tell much you love the flavors and you love food. When did you fall in love with cooking originally? Um, good question. I probably not until I was my second year in the Navy. So, I was a cook in the Navy um, and not necessarily by choice. Uh, It was the only position that had a technical school attached to it that I qualified due to my education, (laughs) right? Not due to my education. My teachers were incredible. I was a bonehead. (laughs) I did what I wanted to do. Um, I've always been an artist. I grew up um, under the, you know, Helm of my my grandmother, who was um, an oil, um, acrylic, and water painter. Uh, she did all kinds of crafts with, you know, a kiln and making her own ceramics. I mean, to the point of, like, she was selling this stuff. She would decorate her church um, on a very high level. And so I was very involved with art. But my last art class, like, I had to beg to not fail because I just wasn't interested in the art that they were teaching. Mm -hmm. Um, In fact, I took poetry and advanced poetry, which counted as a language arts class, so I could graduate high school. (laughs) And I happened to be in love at the time, so it was really easy for me to write (laughs) poetry. (laughs) But those are the kind of things, you know? Um, So I didn't really understand how much I loved food, and I didn't understand that there was a a bridge between food and art. Um, and I didn't realize that until I was having a conversation with my mother. I was in the Navy. I was on the forecastle of uh, an Arleigh Burke class destroyer, the USS Benfold. It was my first ship. And I was just telling her like how much I hated everything about what I was doing. And I was never really held to like not quitting things. If I didn't want to do something, I could just not do it. Yeah. Um, and... 
you know, I, I could start a sport and if I didn't like it, I just peace out. Um, and so for me, I was basically telling her like, I'm, I'm done with the Navy. I'm done. Like this, this isn't cooking. You know, I, I was pretty upset because I had been hazed a little bit, which is very common in that, in that time. And, uh, you know, I would be required to peel 50 pounds or, or five cases of 50 pound potatoes. And then I'm doing it right next to this machine that looks like R2D2. That's actually a potato peeler. <laughs> Right. On a very large industrial level. And so I was just really upset and frustrated and I didn't enjoy what I was doing. And my mom was really smart in the way that she handled this. She started sending me cookbooks and she started and not cookbooks that had like lots of words with recipes, like pretty cookbooks um, because I needed I needed to see the art. In it. She was helping you be inspired by what you were doing. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and what she said to me was what's the difference of painting with a brush and painting with a spoon, right? And not, not verbatim. My mom did not use those words, but she said, you know, essentially like you can paint with food. Yeah. Right. So why don't you start focusing on the beauty of it? And then once you do that and make that a hobby for yourself, you're not leaving the Navy. If you try to leave the Navy, you're going to be breaking big rocks into little rocks. Right. I mean, you're going to be in prison. So get that out of your mind. That's not going to be any fun. You think you don't like cooking. Um, and she just kept following through and sending me things and, oh, you should try this recipe. Um, and then got to the point where I just I just kind of grasped it. And I did exactly that. I focused on the art first and then I learned how to cook with good flavor. And I had great mentors when I was in the Navy. But when I really kind of like exploded was I, I took an opportunity at the Hotel Del Coronado as an externship. And I was bored with what they were asking me to do. Once again, not wanting to work through the process. Um, And I asked if I could go and just watch the chefs cook in their fine dining kitchen, which was the Prince of Wales. Um, It just happened to be that that night somebody had called in sick. And the chef that was down there had no choice but to ask me to help out. And so he threw me on entremet and said, all I need you to do is follow instructions. And I was like, that I can do. <laughs> if anything, the military has taught me, it is how to follow instructions, be disciplined, and don't ask questions, right? So I jumped on the line. A few mistakes here and there caught on quickly. The next day I was pulled into his office with the executive chef of the hotel and they offered me a job. Wow. I just, I couldn't help thinking about how you're talking about leadership and, and helping and how your mom basically showed you these leadership qualities that you've been cultivating in keeping you on track when you're in the Navy by showing you a love of cooking. I mean, really, mm-hmm. your mom basically exhibited those same characteristics that you were talking about, about leadership. And she packaged it in a way that wasn't her, like, dictating the right. law of it, right? The leader, the law of the leadership, the, you know, you need to do this. She was just, she unpacked it very nicely. Um, and I don't think I would have listened in any other way. Yeah. How do you think that our foodie scene here in our, in our city, in our community, how does that contribute to our sense of, um, kind of wholeness, you know, like that sense of like, how does the foodie scene contribute to our Spokane innovation in our community? Well, I think it contributes greatly. Right. And I think some chefs may listen to this and go, does it really though? Cause some people find foodies to be annoying, Right what is a foodie, right? You like good food, but some people's level of what they like versus what a chef likes or what a chef thinks is quality is is skewed, right? And so foodies get a bad rap real quick, Um, especially if they use that, like, that term. (laughs) I'm a foodie. This isn't, you know, and you're like, okay, well, you also have no idea about this, right? And it's a very difficult thing to have a conversation about because, some are great and some are not great, but yet they're all kind of funneled into this one word, right? Well, if you, de- if you define foodie as someone who loves food, right? The, the creation of all these restaurants that have come. I mean, I moved here almost 15 years ago and it was not the way it is now. No, and no. so I just, um, to me, it just seems like having people that have a love of food, if you want to call them foodies, um, you know, and just in the way that that contributes to our sense of community, it seems like it's really made a difference in a positive way. It has made a huge difference in a positive way. And so what I kind of just didn't get to quick enough was really foodies push innovation mm-hmm. in a, in a, in a community because you have foodies tend to find a way to get close with the creators, right? Because they become fans, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, 
or groupies, if you will, yeah, right? the restaurant chef groupies, groupies yeah. right? <laughs> and so they tend to have the ear of the chef or the manager or the server. And they're like, oh man, you know, I really love this type of food. But when I was here, they did this. You should try that sometime, right? And chefs sometimes get stuck in tunnel vision, right? They have a vision of where they want to go. They don't want to listen to anything that anybody is saying. A lot of creatives can sometimes get that way because they become so attached to their work that they're not looking at everything around them and become a little bit too egotistical of everything, right? Um, a good team will help kind of remove that um, or balance it out. But I know for a fact some of my restaurants – have benefited from having so many people who are so interested and and in love with food because they'll bring something to my attention that I didn't notice. And it's it's kind of cool, right? Like I wonder last week there was this whole thing about birria in in our city, right? And birria is a is typically a lamb or a well typically goat or a lamb uh stew, right? And uh, you'll make tacos out of it, and they'll dip the tortilla in the fat layer that's skimming above the stew. And they'll get it onto the griddle. They'll pull some of the meat out of the stew. They'll throw it onto the onto a, a kamal or a uh, plancha. They'll crisp it up a little bit. They'll throw it into the tortilla. Sometimes they'll add cheese, some uh, diced up onion, cilantro. Uh, let it let the tortilla crisp up while it's closed, and then they'll serve it with a consomme that's made from the braising liquid. And it kind of went viral in Spokane in a way. Everyone started doing beauty of this, beauty of that, right? Tacos, quesadillas, pizzas, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. What I wonder is, did somebody go into a restaurant and said, I just got back from Guadalajara and I had this incredible beauty and you should make it. Or was it a chef went on a, on a trip and right. brought it back, and then somebody came there and ate it that was a foodie, and then said, oh, my God, I had this amazing experience, and then reported on Food Finder in Spokane, and now it started to kind of domino effect along the way to all these other chefs, and are like, oh, I would like to run a, a special like that as well. I think that's delicious, right? Or did a chef go and try it and said, I want to do my version of it, right? So there's just – it's interesting how many different directions these things can come from, but I think foodies have – I mean, they have, it's dual, right? They can be the demise right. of, of uh, culinary culture or restaurant uh, food, and then they could be what helps grow it, right? Mm -hmm. And transplants. Transplants, you know, it, as much as people are like, oh, Californians need to stop coming here. Well, <laughs> I think people from all over need to keep coming here because the more things we have coming from different locations is what helps our culinary scene grow mm -hmm. it's, it, it's a constant innovation and um, it really is i'm super curious do you have more new things that are on the horizon or are you <laughs> i mean i know you have so much going on but are yeah. there more amazing things coming from chad white hospitality group Did we have correct? some tricks in our pocket um on on some concepts that we want to do we haven't nailed down locations yet um and there's been this kind of teeter-totter of is this the right time should we hunker down really focus on what we're doing, fine-tune so we know that these things are ready to go without a doubt and we're the best at our game? Or do we take the momentum that we have and continue to grow our business? Um, now that we do consulting, uh, we're consulting at Arborcrest Winery and we created a, a Mediterranean menu that I feel fits very um it fits very well with not only their location and the ambiance of their um, of their grounds, but also the type of wines that they produce. Um, and then doing that got us the opportunity to uh, help Mount Spokane uh, in their uh, culinary operations. Uh, everything from um, you know managing their storerooms and building systems and forecasting for their chefs so that their chef could operate uh, his area. Uh, better, which would then free him up time to be more creative in the kitchen, right? Um, so we've been helping build other people's businesses mm -hmm. and then also trying to do what we're doing with ours. And so uh, long story longer, I think <laughs> that in the next six to eight months, you may see another concept from us, um, but nothing's, nothing's inked. 
Right. Um, we're just kind of, you know, dating. Flirting <laughs> with it. <laughs> dating uh, <laughs> different opportunities. So, Well, it seems like you're always creating. I mean, you can't really seem to stop it. Um, yeah. And speaking of dating, you recently got engaged, I, I heard. Yes. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, we've been uh, together for a little over two years. Um, been living together almost all of that time. And it just seemed right. It seemed like the right time. She is an entrepreneur herself. Um, she is a, a makeup artist and an esthetician. Uh, she does um, movie sets and uh, high level commercials and production, but also um, very involved in the in the bridal area. Um, does between thirty and forty uh, weddings a year. Um, so um, it's been fun, right? We feed off of each other's energy um, and push each other. And I can't think of a better person in my life uh, than that. But she's also very soft and genuine, and uh, she is highly focused on me, <laughs> which well, I, I, who doesn't love that? Who doesn't love that? Well, I'm excited for you and I'm sure you'll have amazing food at your wedding when it ever comes around. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I am lucky to have such a talented team and, and we'll probably make it a little bougie. We'll make it small, but very bougie. Well, it should be. Well, thank you so much for coming on Ignite Interviews. I'm so glad to get to know you better and to hear a little bit about your history and all that you have going on here in Spokane. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you.